When a ligand binds to the receptor site on the outside of the cell membrane, the G protein changes conformation and guanosine triphosphate replaces the guanosine diphosphate on the alpha subunit of the G protein. You gotta love that alphabet soup. All right. Oh my goodness. So let's see if we can break this down. Cell membrane, what the heck was this yellow blob? It's a ligand binding to receptor. What does that mean in English? It's a hormone receptor. Yeah, it's a hormone receptor. So if we back up, that little yellow top, that was the hormone, a non steroidal hormone because it can't get in. It binds to a receptor. The receptor is going to turn on these enzymes that have the alphabet stuff on them. That's going to cause my cell to do something. So they're going to call this a G protein system, a membrane receptor system, a secondary messenger system, an indirect pathway. Pick all the words you want. But because I can't get in, I've got to turn on everybody else. We skip the alphabet stuff here, you know, blah, 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 you know, that's the alphabet stuff. Another way to do it is another view of the same thing. When a signal molecule, such as epinephrine, binds to a cell surface receptor protein, it activates a G protein on the inside of the cell. I thought epinephrine was steroidal, is that from the adrenal gland? It's, in, it's in adrenal cell. medulla, right, so it's a meaning. It <clears throat> But here again, I have a receptor because I can't get in my cell. I bind to that and turn on other things. And those other things are then going to turn on stuff inside my cell. Like here's an enzyme that then is going to change the way my cell responds. Okay. So it's all basically this indirect system. So for your test or quiz, steroids go right in one time. Non-steroids, you got to do a lot of chemistry to get there. That's the big difference between you. Do the peptides in the Basically, they work the same. The only difference is the size of the receptor, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, on steroidal versus not steroidal. So, how you get in. Let's find the next question down. What hormones act as antagonists? Can someone remind me what antagonist means. Stop. Okay. Stop or block or reverse. So in English, this one's saying which hormones have an opposite. So can you look at your list and find Insulin. hormones that are opposites? Insulin and glucagon. Insulin and glucagon. Atrial, nutritic, peptide, and mineral corticoids. Very good. A and P and aldosterone are mineral corticoids. Very good. So PTH, calcitonin. So these hormones have an opposite hormone to counteract them. So let's review. Insulin does what? It lowers my blood sugar. Glucagon does what? Raises. So they're opposites or antagonistic hormones. So aldosterone increases my sodium. AMP gets rid of my sodium, so they're opposite hormones. PTH destroys my bone. Calcitonin builds my bones, so they're opposite hormones. So these hormones work as pairs. One goes up, one goes down. Those are antagonistic hormones or direct hormone antagonists. Make sense? So if you have an opposite, you have an antagonist. But that's different than number three. Number three asks for tropic hormones, EGATs. Let's write that down. So that's a word that's going to haunt you for at least a couple of days. <laughs> The word trophic in biology, in this context, has a very specific meaning. It goes from one endocrine gland to another endocrine gland. So if you are trophic, it's because you're going from one endocrine part to another. Or on your list, from one source to another source. So take a look at your list. And name to me the tropic hormones. Not all of them. Which ones? ACTH. Let's stop there. How do you know that's tropic? It goes from where to where? The hypothalamus to the... Anterior pituitary to my oh. adrenal gland. So it's okay. going from endocrine gland to endocrine gland. So it is tropic. Name another one. FSH. FSH. How do you know that's tropic? It goes from my anterior pituitary to my gonads, which gonads. are endocrine glands. Here's another one. 
Luteinizing. LH, same thing, goes from my pituitary to my gonads. And the one you left off? Prolactin. TSH. Oh, TSH. It goes from my anterior pituitary to my thyroid. These are tropic hormones. They go from one gland to another gland. These are the only tropic hormones you have. I was just going to ask that because I looked this up and it was in conflict with the growth hormone and prolactin. It was like I was getting different information. Right. So, so formally, those are not tropic because they don't go to another endocrine gland. Okay. They go places, but they're not endocrine places. So okay. formally, the answer is no. Okay. To show you, I'm not making this up. <clears throat> Here's a picture showing an anterior pituitary. It's saying the tropic hormones. Why are these tropic? Because they go from one gland to the thyroid or adrenal or gonad gland. So they trope. Okay. So those are tropic hormones. Doing okay on those? Mm -hmm. All right. That's the lead you to the next question. Just this one. Where do they all come from? They all come from one place. Anterior the anterior pituitary. So your anterior pituitary produces four tropic hormones. The ones with lots of H's in them. Right. Look at question four. We have another kind of hormone. Releasing hormone. EGAT. Let's put them over here. You can abbreviate releasing hormone by going RH. You'll see why. These have a name. These go from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. So they're going to go from my hypothalamus and tell my anterior pituitary what to release. Therefore, they're called releasing hormones. Let's see if we can make a list of those. Because they're not on your list. They're not on your chart. But they're on my picture. Mm -hmm. I just scroll up this way. And I see, oh, a hypothalamus. Thyroid. <laughs> I have letters. Let's see if we can figure out the letters. Uh, thyroid releasing hormone. Marriage. They took all the pens that are different colors. All right. I have a red. I'm going to use red. They write on the wall and they take the red pens. Alright. So, what you're going to do when you see these, RH tells you it's a releasing hormone. It tells you it comes from your hypothalamus. It's going to go to your anterior pituitary. The first letter tells you which tropic hormone it's going to talk to. So this T means the tropic hormone it's going to release is going to be which one? Thyroid. The thyroid. So TRH tells the pituitary to release TSH. Thyroid releasing hormone tells my pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. So the releases tell the tropics what to do. Look at the next one. CRH. My cortex, right? What's the hormone it's going to yell at? Very good. The CRH tells my pituitary to yell at my adrenal cortex, ACTH. The dark ages, there's actually A in the front here. Here's one that's going to be a little more difficult. Damn you. GN stands for gonads. All right? Isn't that LH and FSH? Yep. LH. So What's gonad the second word? Gonads what? Gonadotropins. Or gonadotropics. So GN is gonadotropin because your gonadotropics are LH and FSH. So G and RH tells my gonad hormones to come out of my pituitary, which are LH and FSH. So the RHs are from my hypo, H, 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 hypothalamus, and then the tropics are from my pituitary. All right, so you get this relationship on the screen. 
So I have a releasing hormone there, telling my pituitary to release a tropic hormone there. It's then going to go to a endocrine gland somewhere else. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, if that makes sense. Let me show you an animation of this beautiful idea. Here is an animation showing this concept. Before we do that, let me show you a still picture of it just to show you one here, which is right here. So if you remember, last time, your hypothalamus is there, your pituitary is there, and they talk to each other, either with nerves, like in the posterior, or if you notice on this picture, we have capillaries running from my hypothalamus to my pituitary. That's so the releasing hormone can come out of my hypothalamus, go to my anterior pituitary to make it do something. So the fancy word in your book is hypophyseal portal system. I'm never going to ask you to ever say that again. Mm -hmm. right? But there are ways that your hypothalamus can talk to the pituitary, and that's what we're doing with these hormones. So let's watch the magical video. Here we go. The hypothalamus initiates a chain of events that control the endocrine system. Indeed. It releases hormones that trigger the anterior pituitary to release more hormones. These hormones, in turn, control a variety of endocrine organs, such as the adrenal glands. Although the hypothalamus drives the system, the hypothalamus is kept in check by a negative feedback loop. Let's look at a negative feedback loop using the hormones of the adrenal cortex as an before we do that, let's figure out what negative feedback means. What's negative feedback mean? 231? Homeostasis. Homeostasis. Okay. So let's look at the whole screen now. So notice the words inhibition here and here. So that means we can make a graph of this activity. I love, I'm going to put it on the board they screwed up. Right here. I'm going to graph your metabolism over time. So, on from your sheet, what gland controls my metabolism? The thyroid gland. So I'm going to graph my metabolism, my T3 and T4. Alright, you want to have low metabolism or high metabolism? Right. Okay, let's pretend you took some methamphetamine. <laughs> Yay. And your metabolism starts to skyrocket. Right? What do you think your hypothalamus thinks about graphs that go way too high? What is it? I want to bring it down. Remember, homeostasis said I want to keep myself normal. So my hypothalamus would then want to start telling the pituitary to stop yelling at the thyroid, to stop the metabolism. So what will happen to TRH if I have too much metabolism? It will go down. It will go down. I'm going to turn off TRH, or as the thing shows, I'm going to inhibit TRH. As I increase my metabolism, I'm going to start inhibiting my brain. What does TRH do to my TSH? It brings it down. It would bring it down as well. Because TRH tells me how much TSH to make. And what does TSH talk to? The thyroid. And what would the thyroid do if it had less TSH? Make less T3. Make less T3, which should do what to my graph? Drop it down. Negative feedback. So as I get too much metabolism, my brain tells my pituitary to turn off the worker. This is bureaucratic management. Right? <laughs> Your hypothalamus is the CEO. The pituitary is a manager. The gland is the worker. So CEO sends out a memo to tell the manager to yell at the worker to get more product. Right? It's the exact same system as your work. And what happens if you make too much product? Management goes away, right? They vanish. They go on vacation because you're doing better than you should. Let's do the reverse. You don't have any metabolism today. What will a brain think of that? 
It needs to go up. It needs to go up. So what type of memo will your hypothalamus send out? TRH needs to go up. Let me give you get more TRH. I'm going to send out memos. Give me releasing. I want metabolism, damn it. Give me metabolism. That is to your pituitary. The pituitary is then going to do what? TSH goes up. Increase TSH. Well, since you want metabolism, I'll order metabolism. Or TSH. If the thyroid is listening, what should the worker do when management screams a lot? React. Go up. It should up. work. So, the thyroid would then try to increase output and raise your metabolism. So, if you stop working, your boss yells. If you work too much, your boss goes away. That's the logic of the system. So, the brain and pituitary are going to regulate the worker in the body through this RHSH system. That's true for any of these hormones that you saw here. So if you have, I don't know, let's give you one. Let's say you got too much sex. Let's just make it funny. You got too much sexy going on, mm -hmm. right? What will your brain do? It's going to lower the amount of what? GNRH. GNRH. I don't want more gonados. It's going to tell your metal manager to turn off the LHFSH to turn off your gonads. If you don't have enough sexy going on, the brain increases, I want more sexy, to tell you to yell for more sexy to make you more sexy. I'm bringing sexy back. <laughs> <laughs> but you have these three organs talking. Management and worker. All right. Let me show you that I'm not making this up much more. Here's an actual real picture showing what I did the graph. Let's walk through it one more time. Okay, so up here at the top, here's CEO, owner, pick your, pick your analogy, but here's the boss who sends out memos. Those memos are releasing hormones, right there, TRH. So boss says, I want metabolism. I order to be metabolism by yelling at the manager, who's the pituitary. The manager says, yes sir, I'll get you metabolism. By tropicking, is that even a verb? By sending out tropic hormone, TSH, to the worker, who is the thyroid. Thyroid gets the memo and starts to make hormones. Right? When thyroid gets too many hormones, then we're going to have negative feedback and we're going to turn off the management so we don't over-hormone our metabolism. Right? If you don't have enough metabolism, management yells. If you got too much, management turns off. Negative feedback. Right? Make sense? That's, that's the logic behind it. Let's go back to the animation. Here we go. So here we have CEO, manager, worker. The same ideas over here. An example. In response to stress signals, the hypothalamus releases corticotropin-releasing hormone, or CRH. CRH triggers the anterior pituitary to release adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH. So here's the memo. Here's releasing to anterior pituitary, tropic to organ. Right. ACTH, in turn, triggers the adrenal cortex to release a steroid hormone called cortisol. Cortisol has many effects on different target organs in the body, but the primary one is to increase glucose in the blood. Where cortisol was glucocorticoids or cortisone, the same thing. This sugar is an energy resource that allows the body to respond to physiological or psychological stress. In addition to acting on organs and tissues throughout the body, the hormones travel through the bloodstream back to the brain, where they inhibit the release of CRH. Why would you want to inhibit that? Right. You don't want to keep building this thing up, right? So at some point, you need to tell management that you're working fine. So as you make more hormone, you're going to inhibit management's yelling. That way they start turning down the noise. So CRH should go down. Eventually turning off ACTH should go down. You tell me to turn off. Right. Without CRH, the anterior pituitary does not release ACTH. In addition to this effect, the cortisol also acts directly on the anterior pituitary to inhibit ACTH release. Without ACTH, the adrenal cortex stops releasing cortisol. This interaction is an example of a negative feedback loop. In this loop, 
The output of the system, the hormones from the adrenal cortex, ultimately diminish the input from the system, the hormones from the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. This system turns on cortisol release, but then turns it off before cortisol levels get too high. watching the dots that you yes. Okay. So let's fill in that graph one more time, because this graph will come back to haunt you over and over again. <laughs> but this time we're going to change it. Instead of metabolism, I'm going to pick that one they just did. I'm going to pick cortisol or cortisone or glucocorticoids. I lost my it, Isn't it behind the screen? It probably is. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah. So... Let's do that. Let's do glucocorticoids. Let's do, yes, cortisol. Cortisol. Cortisone, glucocorticoids. So same thing. We're going to make a graph. And it should be exactly the same, right? If you're getting, let's say you don't have enough cortisol right now. You're not stressed enough. So what would your brain want? CRH. More. So I'm going to do what? Increase. Of CRH. CRH. Which tells the pituitary to do what? Increase AC. Increase ACTH, which tells your adrenal cortex to turn on. This is cortex. And thereby raise my cortisol level, right? All right. Walk me through if I have too much stress, like right now, besides quitting this class, what can I do? <laughs> something to go, besides crying, something to go up or down. It, it should go down. What should go down? CRH. Very good. CRH would go down. to lower my ACTH. to lower my adrenal gland, which would then tell it to make less cortisol. And turn it off. It's the same graph no matter which of the three you pick. The same graph, the same logic. You increase to raise it. You decrease to lower it. No matter which one you pick. So do that at home. Do LHFSH, do cortisol, do T3, T4. Same graph. That's? Yep. That's the relationship between tropics and releasing and regular. Works so good? We're going to beat you up one more time with this. So get out your packet of doom. We are going to. That one. Find the next page. One have the big chart. I'm going to walk you through this one as a class so we can figure this out. <clears throat> so we got this guy, blah, 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 dull, droopy, puffy, bad, low blood pressure, blah, blah, blah. So, looking at all that, can anyone tell me what? Hormone might be screwed up in this guy to make him not have much metabolism. Thyroid. Uh, Thyroid. Yes. Yeah. So in this case, we're going to say we're going to say thyroid because you read through all that. This is my heart's beating too slow. My blood pressure's too low. I'm not building blood enough. I have a wacko personality. I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. All right, so some kind of ATP thingy. So then we gotta figure out number two. Is it a primary or secondary disorder? All right, here we go. Let's figure out the difference in those words. So a primary disorder, you future nursing types. This means the organ directly involved is broken. A primary disorder means the organ that's directly involved is broken. Or, to keep our analogy, the workers don't work. So diabetes type 2? Or more type, more type 1 would be a better, better call. So if we put this in context, if your thyroid just doesn't work and you have a thyroid problem, that would be a primary disorder. I have a thyroid problem because my thyroid just doesn't want to come on. 
right? The light bulb burns out, that's a primary disorder. The light bulb isn't working, all right? Let's contrast that with a secondary. Can any of you guess from the graph what makes a secondary disorder? Who's the not working? The workers. That's right. Management not working. Welcome to PCC. <laughs> oh, did I say that out loud? All right. <laughs> so I'm still a part-timer. All right. Your thyroid is fine. No one gave it an order to go. Right? So in a primary disorder, the organ that should make the hormone doesn't. It's broken. In a secondary disorder, the organ could make it if it got the memo to do so. Can you repeat that one sure. last time? Sure. Okay. Primary, the organ to make the hormone is broken. Secondary, it did not get the order to make it. Okay. So if I flip on the light switch and the light doesn't come on because the bulb broke, that's primary. If it's because no one ran the wire to the light switch, that's secondary. The bulb's fine, the switch is out. That's kind of logic. So the organ is working, but th it it's not receiving the signal, Correct. the management. Not getting the signal. So the graph. Over Who would here, be the management? Who would be the management? The anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. Okay. Does that mean it's not being received or they're not sending it? Yeah, either way. Okay. Sorry. I either no, didn't get your memo or okay. you didn't send it. But either way, I could do my job if you just told me which, what to do. All right. So, first one, you're on strike. Doesn't matter what management says. Second one, management went left and left you in the lurch. Yeah. Yeah, so the second question. For this one? Let's, let's figure it out. So read the second paragraph here. On this patient, they have the patient has high TSH. Who makes TSH? Antipituitary. So in English, the pituitary or management is yelling. So it's second. There. I don't know. And the TSH did not increase the thyroid gland. So it's primary. Management is yelling like crazy. But your workers aren't working. So therefore, they are on strike. They're not working. So this is a primary disorder. Because if TSH goes up, a thyroid should do something if it's obeying the rules. Okay? Make sense? Mm -hmm. So let's graph that. Yeah. So when they test for your thyroid, they usually look at TSH, yes. right? Yes. Yep. But if it was the anterior pituitary, do they also measure the the T T three T four? They can. They're no, supposed I to do mean, both. Uh, not the TSH. The releasing hormone, just the one that comes from the hypothalamus. They can. Usually, they did with between the TSH and the T three T four, they can figure it out. So what if them. you you came back with low TSH? They would just tell me that there's was nothing wrong with your thyroid. Well, or they would look at case. the symptoms first, wouldn't they? Right. right. If, if you didn't have any symptoms, then there would be... Well. Uh, probably, well, usually what the doctor told me was they check TSH and they check T3, T4, because those should correlate. Right. Yeah. If one of those is off, then that's the problem. If both those are fine and you're still having symptoms, and you work up... Because okay. the TRH is a lot harder test to do. Right, okay. So let's do a graph. Before we get going too far. So... Mm. We're going to graph metabolism over time, just like we had over there. So this patient, what did we say his metabolism was doing? Too much or too little? Too little. So his graph went like this, right? What should TSH have done if it has low metabolism? What should it do? So his TRH should have gone up, making his TSH go up, which should have made his what go up? The, uh, T3, T4. The T4. We should have done T3 and T4. So, did his TSH go up? Yes. 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 That means management was doing its job. You didn't have metabolism, and management began to yell louder and louder and louder. But what didn't happen was the worker didn't produce. So your graph stayed low, even though management's yelling, you didn't do the primary job. You didn't make hormones in response to management. Right. It's like if you're a nurse someday and you just don't listen to the memo. That's what you're I'm just gonna do my own thing. Right. 
My dean tells me what to do, and I ignore it anyway. That's, that's PC. Yeah, so the question would be like graph or the graphing or case. Uh huh. This would be the graph. If I graph metabolism, this is the graph. If I graphed TSH instead, what would TSH be doing in this patient? TSH would be going up, right? Because the management's yielding more and more. T3, T4, though, would stay flat or low because it's not responding. Right? Make sense? Yep. So as you get less work, management yells more. Right? So everyone make sense on that primary disorder? We've proved mm -hmm. that the management's yelling, workers aren't working. So let's do number three then. Describe the feedback loop. Hey, I bet you it's this picture. Wow, oh, it is. Right? Because, just to beat you over the head one more time, if this were working, what should TSH do? If this is working, this should go down, right? But it's going up, which means not you're not working. You're no longer getting inhibition from the worker. You're not making your graph go up. So you can either take a picture of that with your phone, you can just say that's oh, on the graph. You've had the same graph now four times. But that's the inhibition. If my workers are working, I should stop making the trophic and releasing. Inhibits both of the anterior and pituitary. Yes. And the both of them should shut off. Okay. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So what do they do in that case? The uh, worker is then we have a group doing levothyroxine, they'll just give you thyroid hormone. Hmm. Right. At least that's my understanding. Or they can take out your brain. It's a little hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> but what the doctor would have to do is diagnose, is it the worker or is it the management that's causing your problems? And so they usually test both to verify, you know, is it bad management, like a PCC, <clears throat> or is it bad workers, also like PCC. <clears throat> So you can have two places you can have errors. One is the management decisions, and one is... So work. if the organ wasn't working, they wouldn't... They would still give them the hormone? Right. If management's not working, then you either have to take TSH, which you really can't, or you just have to compensate with a drug, which is harder to do. Let's do number four. Would you find a goiter? So remind me what a goiter is. Um, the big bulge. Big thyroid, right? So, let's go over here. If TSH keeps climbing and climbing and climbing, what do you think your thyroid organ would do if it keeps receiving all these nasty memos from this boss? Grow. It will grow. So you would have a goiter. Yes, you would. If you don't answer your emails, your inbox gets bigger. That's the same concept. So the brain is yelling at the thyroid to grow to try to up the output. Right? So a goiter implies you're getting too much signal from your brain towards your thyroid. You're amplifying that. But so why? A goiter is a primary disorder? Yes. It can also be secondary. It depends on why. So let's give a treatment. So why isn't his thyroid working? What makes a thyroid not work? Isn't it something with the salt? The yes. What's in salt? Iodine. Iodine. Let's talk about iodine just for a brief second. This is why you eat French fries, right? Am I the only one that admits that? Yep. Well, not all salt has iodine. All right, so iodine, iodized salt, is to stop you from having this problem. Worthless trivia, I'll never ask you this. Does anyone know what the number by the T stands for? Right, triiodothyronine, oh tetraiodothyronine. This is how many iodines you need to make the molecule. So if I don't eat my iodine, I can't build my T3, T4. And what organ makes T3, T4? The thyroid. The thyroid. So your thyroid can't make product. So what will your management do if you're not eating your iodine? They just yell louder and louder and louder. So you get a goiter because you're trying to grow more thyroid, but you don't have the iodine. The Midwest was the goiter belt because they had no iodine in their plants. That's why they added to salt, is to avoid this. Is that the only thing they added to? And that's normally what they added to. You don't need it for any other reason, mostly. You know, table salt is easy. Everyone has it in everything. So you just add it to salt. And done with it. That is why, though, it's legislated to be in salt. 
So, I mean, how can anybody not get enough salt? It must You'd be, be amazed. because your body can't function. <laughs> You'd can't, be amazed. Can't, uh, Before they added it to table salt. Yeah, but now, currently. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, everyone so gets enough it, salt. One French fry, you're good to go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so there must be some, your body must not be able to metabolize the salt that you get from the French fry or something, right? Or well, most people in the U.S. don't have goiters anymore. But it's common in third world countries. But, I mean, you still have, have hypothyroidism is even right. well, they did, right? Or that's, that, that may not be from the iodine. Oh, okay. Yeah. There are other reasons. Okay. But the most so, common reason was you didn't have iodine. That's why they add the iodine to your salt was to avoid this whole... Half of Kansas before 1930 was a goiter. Because they didn't get iodine, and they just all had a goiter. Look at the old pictures, and, you know, everyone's got something like that. So if you don't eat table salt... Then you have to eat sea salt. Is it? Yeah, but it's not in sea salt. Iodine can't be in sea salt, depending on which coast it's made from. But it's they don't particularly put it in. They don't add all it. That's the trick. It depends on which sea salt you get and how they manufacture it. So the soil in third world countries doesn't have iodine. A lot of them don't. Right, based on the soil type. So the Midwest had lots of fluoride, but no iodine. Uh, Oregon has iodine and fluoride in our soil, mm -hmm. and then different. So it varied by pockets. After they figured this out, is iodine and fluoride was based on where you lived. They kind of made those Can uh, fluoride affect your thyroid though? Like Not there's this nope. thing that nope. they say about. That's why they. That's how they discovered all these minerals. Was you go to the one town, like, hey, everyone here, no cavities. That must be something in their water. Yeah. That's a fluoride. Hey, everyone's got a goiter. They don't have iodine. <laughs> right? That's how they figured all this stuff out. Is just watch people who don't have it and watch how they live. We're the yeah. trivia. Yeah. yeah. Dentist from Texas who figured out the fluoride thing. Right. Awesome. You drive around towns and realize, hey, you have no cavities. Hey, there's fluoride in your water. Must be connection. 1910. That's it up. Yeah. Make sense, though? So again, if I don't have the output, the management's going to yell more. Okay. Make sense? Okay, so let's do another primary disorder quickly here. Another endocrine disorder. This one you should be familiar with since 50% of your patients will have this in healthcare. What's wrong with Cindy? Diabetes. Diabetes. You even didn't have to read far until you got to the 545 blood sugar, right? She's dripping maple syrup, right? That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. It's only, what, three times higher? Yes. All right. So we know it's diabetes, right? So some of these questions are from 112, but we'll skip those. We're going to go down to the ones that are hormonal, right? We're going to go down to number five bottom of the page. She gives herself insulin. What's the job of insulin again? To lower, lower blood sugar. So why does she have to have candy? Isn't candy sugar bad? Right. Let's make a graph. So blood sugar. So here's Cindy. She's taking her little got her blood sugar and she takes her insulin. Do it right there. And what does insulin tell your blood sugar to do? Go down. Go down. Puts it into your cells, takes it out of your blood. So her graph would go sure. blah. Okay? And what happens to you when your blood sugar goes blah? Okay. You go blah, right? Your brain turns off. So how do you raise blood sugar? Candy. You eat it. That's one. But why would she have glucagon? Go back to your chart. Glucagon is what to insulin? Antagonists. Antagonists are the opposite. So if I take glucagon, your gluca is gone, take glucagon. It would then raise my blood sugar, take it out of my cells, put it back into my body, or my blood. Hopefully to balance out the insulin. Right? So if you overdose on insulin, you'll die unless I can raise your blood sugar back up. The candy bar thing. So insulin coma, candy bar, or glucagon. Right? Make sense? So again, they're antagonistic, so I can undo the one with the other. Make sense? So if you read through here in your future nursing career, right, just take it the same time every day, eat the same food, so you can adjust the insulin to gone ratios. Right? Let's turn the page real fast. That way you have time to cram before your lab exam. So what's wrong with this diabetes thing? Why should we care that 50% of America is diabetic? What's so bad with that? What's wrong with high blood sugar? Gee, sugar's good for you. It's really bad on your heart. It's bad on your heart? What else is it bad on? Your feet. Feet, yeah. Why? Why do feet not like sugar? Things don't like it. Very good. So if you go back to biology 112, you're adding sugar to blood, which makes it thicker. Right? 
What does thicker blood not do real well? It doesn't circulate. Where's the furthest part from your heart is? Your feet. Your feet. So as the blood tries to travel with a scoop, it can't get to your feet very well. And what do feet cells do when they don't get fed with blood? They die, right? So give me a cell in your feet that's really sensitive to running out of air and nutrients. No. Nerve cells are really sensitive. So what do diabetics complain about with their feet? They can't what? Neuropathy. Neuropathy. They, they can't feel. They don't know they're stepping on a bottle in the beach because the blood can't get to their nerves. Their nerves die off. Right? Make sense? And then what happens when they get cut on their feet and they don't feel it? Gangrene. Gangrene, infection, amputation. Right? So even though it's just blood sugar, it screws up the ability to get the blood where it wants to go. So don't they have a harder time healing as well? Healing because you can't, you think sugar would be good for healing, but it's not. Because yeah. you can't get the blood to move. Yeah. Right? Glaucoma, blah, blah, blah. Right. So we're going to go down to this bottom one here. This last, so there's more in here. So if you read through this whole blurb, which you can read, her kidneys give out eventually. Right? <laughs> That's what happens to diabetics. And then she's going to have calcium problems. Uh -oh. There's a decrease in calcium. So how could she fix blood calcium? What hormone on your sheet might be related to blood calcium? There are two that deal with blood There's calcium. There's calcitonin. Calcitonin and BDH. So let's see. There's a decrease in blood calcium right here. So she would want them to increase the blood calcium, right? Let's make a graph. Gee whiz, the same graph every time. How about that? On your next test, just draw a graph. <laughs> just don't even label it, just, just draw it, right? Okay, here's her blood calcium. And her blood calcium is doing that, right? Yeah. Go back to 231. What hormone would raise my blood calcium? PTH. So my PTH would climb to raise my blood calcium. Where does it get that calcium to raise my blood? Cells. From my bone cells. I'm going to increase my osteoclasts. I'm going to destroy my bone to get the calcium back up into my blood. Right? So in addition to destroying her feet, she's now going to become osteoporotic. Perfect. Because she destroyed her kidneys, which she used to do this. Right? So read what they call it, number nine. What's going to happen to her bones? You're going to get what? Brittle, weaker, right? Hence they call it renal osteodystrophy. You're losing your, your loss of your kidneys is making you destroy your bones. <clears throat> because you have too much sugar in your body. Make sense? The future of healthcare in the U.S. is that. <laughs> Diabetes leads to renal, renal yes. leads to osteo. Yes, history. if you live long enough to get there. Okay. So according to the studies, 50% of probably the people that you'll see in your office are there because of one of these. Glaucoma, re, uh, dialysis problems, bone problems, blood sugar problems. It's this. So diabetes is a concern. Okay. Make sense? But, Think about the graph, so if your blood sugar goes up, how can I make it go down? My calcium's up, how can I make it go down? So what you want to do is that magic chart that you hated so much, now start making graphs out of it and think, well, if this went up, what would this do? How can I fix it or not? Make sense? Yeah. Especially the management. Who would yell if my thyroid was slow? Who would yell if my thyroid was high? Make sense? Good for you. Okay, so you can cram for the next 45 minutes if you want. We can start your exam early. I don't care. It's all set up, waiting for your beloved.